Um, hello, I'm Nicolas Tuki. I work in the lamp here at EPFL, and, <laughs> and I'm working on uh, metron programming for Dotty. Um, so first, uh, uh, we're going to focus more on macros than other kind of uh, metron programming in this presentation. Um, so for, to, to, to start this talk, we're, I'm going to quickly uh, say something about the Scala 2 macros. Um, so the implementation was... Uh, quite coupled with the, the, the compiler, uh, Scala-C compiler internals. This led to some portability issues, even in, in a different version of uh, Scala 2X, 2 um, which make it quite impossible to, to port to Dotty. There were quite a few attempts, and unfortunately it was deemed impossible. So what we did for Dotty is redesign the core of the, of the metam programming infrastructure. Um, and we focused on being, firstly, more, uh, more portable, uh, leveraging the tasty file format that we have now. And we also focus on making life simpler and safer for both the implementers of, of the macros and the users of the macros. Um, and we also added some new language features, which sometimes are are just can just be used instead of, instead of the macros that we have we would have used in Scala 2. Um, so we're going to cover the, these three topics. Uh, first is inline as a metric programming feature. Uh, then we're going to cover match types to compute new, new types. And then we're going to into macros, which is really um, user written code that will execute some code to compute some new program that will be generated. Uh, in place. And there we have two subsections, which are the quotes and splices, which is a simple and high level API. And then we have the tasty reflex, which is the equivalent of the abstractions that we have right now in, in the Scala 2 macros. But they're a bit more restrictive, and we're going to see exactly what are the details of that later. So, first, inline. So, inline seems like it's just. Uh, an optimization. I go, I'm going to take this code and I'm going to put it wherever I'm going to call this method. But later we're going to see how we can make this do much more. So first, let's see the syntax. So we have a, this new inline keyword that we can put in a def. And in this case, we have a log, log method that will take a message, print it, and then we'll compute some tongue. We'll, uh, we'll print the result and then we'll return that result. So having this inline keyword will guarantee us that this method will be inlined. It might also be recursive, so we can use log inside of log. Um, we also have a way to specialize the return type. I'm going to go more in depth later. And it's also the entry point for macros. So a macro is just a way to implement this inline method. So here we can see the, the object logger, where we implement this log function uh, method. Um, and here we, we, we defined an ident a variable ident, which, which is public. And then inside of the implementation, what we do is print the message. We increase this ident. Then we compute the result of the, uh, of the tongue. Um, and finally, we decrease the ident. Now, uh, the important part here is that tongue must, is um, by name because we don't want to compute it before we print the message. And below there is a snippet where we actually use this, this log operation which, with a power function and we print a message just before that basically tells us which power we're computing. So when we inline this code, it will look something like this. So the message will be put in a, in a val then we're going to have the, the print line, just like before, the ident. Well, we're going to prefix it because we're not directly inside of the, of the object anymore. And we're going to have then the computation of the power. And we're going to continue with the unindentation. We print the result. So as I said before, it's important to have these distinctions between um, by name and by value. So if we have a by name parameter, what we usually do is eva evaluate the, the, 
the, the argument and then pass the result to the function. But with a by name parameter, we just pass a way to compute this in, uh, inside of the body of log. So we need to keep the semantics when we inline. Now here, we, we base, to do that, we just inline completely the code that was in the tongue, directly in where it's used. Um, now, imagine if uh, our ident variable would be private. Then, whenever, wherever we're going to inline this, we might actually not have access to this ident. Uh, to overcome this limitation, whenever we refer to, um, to a private or a protected um, member, uh, we may create um, accessors and setters for those variables to be able to access them from outside, though those accessors will not be visible uh, from the user. It will just be generated uh, later in the pipeline. Um, now, what about uh, recursively inlining some code? So here we see a power function, quite standard, where we, we um, if the, the value is, if the, if the exponent is zero, then we just return minus one. If the exponent is, uh, is odd, we will multiply once the value and then do the power of x to the power of minus one. And uh, if we have a, an odd power, we're going to multiply x twice and, and, uh, and do the exponent of that to the, to the half of what we had before. So here we're using power inside of the definition of power. So how are we actually going to inline this code? Uh, let's see, for example, with power of x and 10. We know statically what the value of 10 is, and therefore when we inline this code, it will look something like that. We see that uh, because we knew statically 10, we could constant fold it and use it wherever we, ha we had before n. And then we also know static, we can also constant fold those uh, conditions and know that the first two are, are, are always false. So we know we are only going to get the, um, the last branch. Therefore, the actual result will be this code. And then we have, a, again, a, 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 a call to power, which we can recursively inline until we don't have any more, and we get some code that, that looks like this, which does not refer in any way to n. Now, what happens if we actually don't know statically the value of n? For example, here we have a bad power where n is just a parameter and we don't know. So if we start inlining, we're going to, to get more and more code. And if you see all those conditions inside of the ills, if, if we're, we're never going to be able to, to know if they're going to be true or false, therefore, this will be just an infinite uh, recursion. Uh, to overcome this issue, we have, uh, uh, or one way to overcome this issue is to have this inline parameter. So what, what it does is wherever we're going to call this power, power function, we need the argument to do that parameter to be a, cons uh, um, a constant value, a non-constant value. Therefore, we're going to be able to constant fold later on. And this works on any primitive values that the compiler knows about, and some case classes such as option, um, basically things that the compiler already knows how to optimize and understands the semantics of it. Now, there's another way to achieve the same thing um, for this particular case, and it's telling the if that it must be reduced whenever it's in line. So we add this, this inline keyword but this time on the, on the if statement, before the if statement, to tell wherever I'm going to inline this, if the condition is known, then reduce it, and if it's not, then fail, and tell me that this thing cannot be reduced, and don't try to continue. And this, also, this will guarantee us that we only take one branch of that. So if we know how this should be reduced, and that the um, things, that the variables uh, decrease, then we know that we're eventually going to finish. Um, and the error that we would get is something similar to that, where you say uh, we could not reduce because n, we, don't, we cannot reduce n equals zero because we don't know what n is. Now, this doesn't only apply to, to if then else, but it can also be used for uh, pattern matching uh, with a match. 
So for this, let's uh, take this uh, simple encoding of uh, Peano as an ADT, where we have a natural number, uh, which has two, two cases, uh, zero or a su successor of another natural. And we're going to use it to create a twint met method that should re result after inlining as just the value two for this particular example, because we have successor of successor of zero. So how would we implement this? Um, we put the inline before the, the match, and then this means that one of those branches should match whenever we inline this code. In this case, we're going to match twice over the successor, and then at the end, once on the zero, and we're going to then consent all the plus operation on int to create the two. And this also guarantees that we're only going to take one of those branches. But so, sometimes we, we might want to be even more precise. What happens if we also want to refine the, the type of what is returned? So for that, we have this uh, new notation where we are saying um, the result type is not a, a normal result type, but it's just a subtype of int. That means that after inlining, this will either have an int or, um, or a more precise type, such as a literal constant type, like one, two, three. Therefore, we could just rewrite using the same implementation. We could just get it inlined and know that uh, NAT2 has actually type literal 2. Uh, to see another example of this, uh, let's see, introduce a, a class hierarchy where we have a, a class A and a class B that extends A, and B has a method that A doesn't have. Um, and then we have an inline method, choose, that will take a Boolean, and depending on what, uh, if it's true or false, it will either return A or B. And if it's true, it will return A, and if it's false, it will return B. So if you use that thing, um, that implementation, we will for val a of type uppercase a, choose of true, will return us an a. But we, if, we, if we do it with choose of false, we, we can refine the type to something more precise, which is b. Usually, if we would have just written uh, return type as a, we would have gotten an error there. And therefore, we can actually use choose of a to restrict, the, to, to know that we can actually call method method uh, met on, on choose of false because we have a B, which we would, ha would have been impossible before. Um, last, but, last but not least in this category, we imagine if we want to uh, implement the set for function that will take a type parameter and return a set of that, par that type. Um, and what we want is that if we have an order on the part, on the t. We want uh, 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 to use a tree set, and if we don't have an order, we just fall back to a hash set. So in Scala 2, we would have to have done some um, prioritization of implicits, quite clunky, in a clunk clunky way. But here we can just say, okay, we have this in, in implicit ma match, but here we we are not giving it anything to the match. We're the the value that we're going to take is going to be searched. So when, uh, when we say case ordering of t, we're going to look for that ordering of t, and if we have it, then we're going to, to, to take that branch and we will instantiate the tree set. If we don't have it, then we, we just fall back to the other set. Mm. So, so far we have seen how to um, refine terms into terms and get more precise types from terms. But there's another way to get more precise types, and it's get, getting a type from another type. So that's what type matches are for. And so as a first example, let's see this simple LM match type. So on the right-hand side, we see that there is an, a type, X, that matches some cases. Usually, we, we at least take one parameter for these things, because we're going to match on that parameter, but we could have more type parameters. In this case, the first case will uh, take a string, and if it's a string, our element of a, our individual element of a string will be a character. If it's an array, 
Then we're going to bind a type that comes from that array. If it's an array of int, it will be int. And if it's an array of Boolean, it will be Boolean. We use the same notation as in normal pattern matching, uh, where uh, lowercase um, names uh, mean type bindings. And now let's see some examples. So as I said, um, the element of string would be equal to character, equivalent to character. Um, the element of an array of int would be just int because we, put, uh, we will going to match the second case. Um, and the element of a list of float will be float because we match the third case. And the element of, an, of, of nil will be nothing because nil is actually a list of nothing. So that's the nothing that we get there. Well, to get to into a more complex example, uh, let's introduce this uh, tuple abstraction where we have a tuple which has two, two subtypes, a uh, unit, which is kind of the tail of the, of the tuple, and, and then we have a cons operator with a star column the, that has a head type and a tail type, and we're going to construct um, tuples by composing those types. So b on, below on the left, we can see how we would write a type with this. Um, and on the right, we see the same thing, but on the, on the terms. And, so, and now we're going to add some, some interesting operations on this. Uh, the first one is the cons operator. So we're going to inline it to uh, produce some, some actual code, but what you can see is that the return type is a cons type, which is, well, trivially the definition of the cons. cons. So there is no issue there. But now what happens if we go to um, concat? Then we, traditionally we wouldn't have a direct way to, to express that I have my left tuple and I have my right tuple and I want the type that corresponds to those two, two tuples concatenated. We would encode that with implicits and some more complex machinery. But here we can just say, okay, give me those two types and I'm going to compute the, the full concatenated type. And we do the same for size, but in this case, we're going to say that size is, it's either an int if I don't know the size of my tuple statically from the type, or it's going to be a literal int if I know the size. Um, let's see the, the, the first example that we already seen in the, in the in Martin's keynote. So this is the concat implementation. It's quite straightforward. We take the left and the right as x and y, then we're, we say that uh, the result of concat will always be a tuple, um, but maybe something more precise. And then we give the actual definition that will compute the type. So we're going to say that if the right-hand side of the, uh, uh, of the concat is empty, then we'll just take the, the left-hand side. If we have um, an unempty tuple, we're going to take the head and we're going to concat with the tail, uh, no, we're going to cons it with the concatenation of the tail and y. This is quite familiar because we would have implemented it almost the same way on lists. Where, and the key difference here is that in, in the match ev on the top, everything is a type. So the, the scrutiny is a type, the patterns are types, and the right-hand side are types. And in the normal case, in the con concaton lists, it's, uh, we're, we're pattern matching on a term, and then we have a term as a pattern, and we have a right-hand side, which is a term. Now let's look at another um, type match. So this is the um, type match for the, a successor of some particular int. So ideally, we should pass it a literal, literal int, which is e either one, two, three, and so on. And we want to return the successor of that int. So one way to implement it is like this, which is straightforward. But of course, this will not scale. So we actually implement it directly in the compiler. Um, as, and that can be found in the package Scala compile time S for the type S of successor. And now we can use this type to compute size. So size will take the, the, the type of the tuple. We know that it will return at least, uh, at most, an int. And now if the, the, the type of the tuple is unit, then we know statically that uh, this tuple is, is empty. And if not, if it's not empty, we can just say that it's the successor of the size of the tuple, which would be equivalent to a plus one if we would have been doing the size 
on the term level. So, no, so far we have seen how to, how to compute types, pre really precise types, but we haven't seen how to get those types back into terms. So for this we have those two methods, uh, const value and const value opt. The first one will take a literal, and if it's a literal, it will re just return that literal. Um, and if it's not, it will fail compilation. On the other hand, the second one, if it's not a literal, it will return none. If it's a literal, it will return some of that literal. So now we can actually implement uh, our inline method size, because we're saying that we'll return a size. And inside, we can just take that size that we computed, um, ask for the value, and then we can pattern match on that value and just optimize our way. So if we actually know the, the value, then we just use that value. If not, we're going to fall back and compute at runtime. So, so far we've seen how to, to generate code by, by leveraging the, mostly the constant folding of the compiler. But here we're going to, to introduce, to, to see how, what happens if we, uh, we actually want custom logic that should do the constant folding. So that's where we introduce macros, which is more the domain of the old Scala 2 macros. But we're going to start with a simpler, simpler approach to, to implement them. So for that, we're going to introduce two, two different concepts, quotes and splices. So the first, quotes, is, has uh, this notation. It has a quote um, and a block, and inside of that block there is an expression. That expression, in that case, has uh, type T. And what this, this block means is I'm not going to execute this code right now. I'm just going to keep it as code for later, and I'm going to use it later in some program. And on the other hand, we have the splice, where inside of some program, in this case, inside of this quote, I'm going to splice this piece of code, and I'm going to replace the code that is inside by this piece of code. This means that exp is of type uh, exp of t, and whatever's inside of this uh, splice is going to be computed, computed when we compute the quote. But we're going to retain everything that is in between the quote and the splice. This is quite similar to a string interpolator. Uh, the syntax uh, is, the syntax rules are quite similar, um, but the difference is that whatever is directly inside of a quote is actually a term uh, that can be used within the splice again. We're going to see some examples of that later. So we can do exactly the same on types. We can quote a type, and then we can splice a type into a piece of program. So now, what, how would we define the macro with that? So we're going to retake the same inline def power of long and inline int as before, but instead of uh, implementing directly, we're going to say, okay, I have a splice here, and I'm going to compute this expression for x and a known n, and I'm going to insert this code wherever I inline it. So the user will actually not see any of those expert types. It will only see the inline and the, the normal types that you would expect from the user. Um, but uh, before I said that we had to uh, insert a splice inside of another quote or program, so in this case, we don't really have a quote directly visible, but we're assuming that by inlining, we're, our quote is actually the program where we're inlining this, this piece of code. And this is the exception, and it's the only place where you can use a splice that is not within another quote. Now, let's do a parallel between the previous implementation and, um, and how we would implement this um, this, exp, this power exp. So first we can see that the um, type signature differ a bit. Uh, so before we, have, we had an inline n, which now becomes just an n. So before we wanted to know it, to enforce it to be a constant value, and now we're just saying, okay, this is a value that I know right now when I'm executing this code. And on the other hand, the, uh, the x, that before we just had it as some normal 
parameter. Now we have it as an expert, uh, as an expert of long, which means that we have some code to refer to it, but we don't actually know what's its value. Um, so now, wherever we had the inline if, where we expected it to partially evaluate this condition and then probably the, the remove the one of those branches, instead of that, we just have a normal program that will just run on uh, execute the n equals zero. It could be any other arbitrary uh, method that the user defines. But now, the result will be a quote which means that we're going to return a piece of code that we're going to insert somewhere. Um, you can see that there is quite a lot of uh, syntactic overhead, additional syntactic overhead for this, but this comes with the, with the benefit of, how, of being able to run arbitrary code. And here we see how, to, how we can just, def our piece of code in this case is, is defining the val x and it's going to refer twice to the value of x that is defined somewhere else. And then we're going to use that to compute the power x with y and n minus 2 inside of the splice. And then we're going to take whatever was computed from there and insert it in this piece of code. Um, so, well-typed macros cannot go wrong. So, we do have some nice rules uh, to, to make this type check correctly. And the, 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 basically, the unique rule is for any free variable reference, the number of quoted scopes and the number of spliced scopes between the reference and its definition must be equal. If we have this, then we can ensure that if this program is well, well typed, whatever we're going to generate will also be well typed. Um, so, for example, here we have uh, we, we defined the val y, and we're using it inside. But you can see that there is first a splice and then a quote in between the definition and the use site. So we have the e equal numbers, and we can use it. And the same for uh, x and n. But in this case, we first have a quote, and then we wherever we use x, we, we have a splice in between. And the same for n. We can also see that uh, we have references, for example, to long and the times operation and other uh, operations. Those are not really free variables because they're known statically and globally. So they don't depend on the current um, context of this method. So those, uh, anything that is globally defined can be accessed in, inside of a quote. Now, what about white box macros? Actually, this becomes fairly trivial, where, because it's basically just a combination of the specialized return type that we saw before and um, a macro as a body for the inline method. So basically, if we compute some expression wi within that, that splice, if it's, more, uh, if it's more precise than x in this case, then we're actually going to insert something uh, that is more precise, and we're going to use that type at the call site just like with normal in line with the subtype return type. So what if we actually want to inspect inside and see what's the value inside of, of, a, of some expression? So let's take this example where we have uh, a, a tuple and we want, we want to swap the, the elements. And this particular implementation if it receives a reference, then it will just call the normal swap method on the tuple. But if we receive it explicitly, we'll just swap the elements and construct the tuple directly. Here we take this tuple by name, because in the second case where we swap the tuple, we don't want to evaluate the first tuple in the first place. Now, to actually implement this is quite straightforward, because we can just take this tuple that we have as an input and just pattern match on it with a quote as pattern. So here we can see that we're, pattern, we're expecting a, a, a tuple of size two, in, and we're going to get each of the, a reference to each of the elements. And we're going to then construct another tuple, and we're going to put those elements in, but in the reverse order. So one important note here is that this pattern is, is fully typed, 
and the type of x1 is, is statically known and will be statically known on the other side when we reconstruct it. Therefore, everything, everything is again fully typed. This has some limitations because we could not ask, uh, am I calling some method called apply without being a subtype of function or something like that. Um, now, if you look at the other example, we, we're basically going to just uh, use a tuple and call swap on it. Mm. So lastly, uh, I added uh, here, we can see that there is an extra parameter called reflection. This is what allows us to look to, to decompose the tuple. Uh, I'm going to go in and describe what it actually does internally later. But for now, as long as we just uh, pattern match on quotes, we just need to have it, but we don't care about what's inside. Now, for another example, uh, so the previous example, we were, we were pattern matching on the shape of the tree, but sometimes we want to, to, to get some other properties of the, uh, of the, of the expression. Um, so let's retake the, the power function like we had did in the, in the pr previous version, but this one is just the one that just computes the power. And then the power x, which will compute the code for a power uh, for a known n. And we're going to use it in our implementation of this x2 that will receive two expressions. So we don't statically know any of the values. But we can pattern match on both with this uh, const um, extractor that will return uh, match if the value inside if the, if, if the expression is actually a value and will just return as the value. So if we know both values, we can just call at, run uh, at compile time the power function and then take that, that value that we have computed and create an expression from it and insert it into the program. If we only know the, the, um, the, the exponent, then we can gen uh, use the power exp to generate the optimal code for... Uh, um, for that, that doesn't reference uh, n anymore. And if we don't know anything, then we can just quote the, f the, the power function, which means that we are going to compute this power function later on at runtime. And again, we need this reflection, um, reflection parameter. So, so far, we, we, we've seen well-typed macros. So now we're going to go into what is more similar to, to, um, to Scala 2 macros, uh, where we are going to just use a, an API directly on trees to uh, really deep, uh, deep into all the properties of the, of the expression. So first, uh, we have this tasty concept. We have it as a, both as a file format, uh, which is the standard encoding for uh, Scala tree type trees. Um, these type AS3, ASTs uh, have a source position. They also contain uh, Scala doc comments. It's extendable. And on the other hand, we have tasty reflect, which is what we used before uh, as parameters. So this is just an interface on top of those trees that allows us to, allows us to uh, inspect and construct trees. Uh, all, it also allows us to inspect positions and uh, doc comments. And it's stabi it, the stability of this interface is given by the stability of the file format. So that's one of the reasons why we, we will not have the same portability problem as with Scala 2 macros, because our interface is not with the compiler itself, it's with the stable file format. Um, so, before I, I, I showed how to use this const extractor, but now we're going to see how we actually implement it. So, the implementation here will receive this reflection, which is our API on trees. And first, we're, to use it, we're just going to import the contents of this uh, reflection, which was, will give us access to all the types, all the methods, and everything that is all the logic that we could do on on trees. So to use that, we first at the bottom have an expression and we will want to unseal it. That means taking an expression and viewing it as a tree. 
And in this particular case, because it's an expression, it's actually a term, which is a subtype of tree um, that we're going to work on. So we can also pattern match on different internal trees. Uh, in this case, we are going to just, uh, if it's a literal, then we're going to take it. Uh, if it's a block with uh, empty statements, we're just going to ignore the statements and say, yeah, it's, it's a literal, it's fine. Um, but note that there is a cast here. Um, because we take the value from a, a, a term. The term doesn't have the, the type information as we had with the, the expression. So here we, we lose some, some, some assurance from the type system that this will actually succeed. But of course, in this case, we know it will because we know that we got an expression of that t. So if, it's, if it contains a value, it must be a value of that same t. Mm. So we, ha we already have some, some quite advanced prototypes. So for, for one, there is uh, the shapeless tree, which uses special inline depths, inline matches, and implicit match. It doesn't use any macros currently. Uh, we're going to experiment to see what happens if we use them. Um, what else can we do? Um, then the, the implementation that I showed before of the tuple is actually a simplification of what we actually do in the compile. Uh, in our standard library to extend the tuples and have tuples of RIT more than 22. Um, we basically generalized tuples to have uh, normal H list um, properties. And for that, we just use match types and inline, nothing more. And then we use a, a few uh, optimizations inside. Um, we also re -implement, uh, helped re-implementing um, all the macros in Scala test. Uh, the, well, yeah, it was quite a lot of work. Um, and then we have a couple of other uh, outliers where we uh, took some string interpolators, turn macros, and re-implemented with macros. So there is the F interpolator that is in the standard library, which uses the macros to check that um, the contents of the string, the, the F interpolator, are are correctly formatted, and it will not fail the, f the parsing of the formatting at runtime. Um, and we also have an XML string interpolator, which uses uh, macros speci and specializing inline in this case. The, the other one that didn't only use macros. Um, and the XML interpolator is uh, intended to replace the, the um, XML literals. So thank you. Um, is there any questions? Uh, I see someone. Um, uh, I see two in the center. Hi. Uh, where? Oh. How does this connect with uh, efforts around Scala meta? It doesn't really connect. Um, so we had another, uh, actually, we have another prototype where we, we, but we didn't use exactly macro infrastructure, but we used a tasty reflect uh, interface to 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 um, to take the, the tasty trees and generate the semantic DB that um, that uh, Meta uses. So it's kind of uh, separate, but we can generate one from the other. Um, Will there be any replacement for where? Scala to oh. runtime reflection, in particular reflecting over types at runtime? Yeah, not not right now, not with this infrastructure. Uh, okay, uh, two questions. First one, uh, how do you raise custom compilation errors from inline methods and macros? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, hmm. I don't think I have a slide with that. But uh, we have a couple of, uh, of uh, other methods in the compile time uh, package uh, for inline met uh, methods. So if you, there is a uh, Scala compile time error method that if you call inside of an inline method 
and it gets in line, and then that branch is not eliminated, then it will uh, uh, emit an error with the message that you wrote inside. Uh, okay, and I and also for, wanted to... Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, and, and for uh, if we have uh, quotes and splices, we have a similar but different uh, mechanism to also raise exceptions. And if we actually if you use uh, um, the um, reflect API, then we can even go more precise. For example, in the in the string interpolators, we could get uh, error messages for a subpart of the string and say this part of the string is not correctly formatted. Uh, okay, I, I also wanted to ask about uh, the example with match types. I noticed that you have matched a nil type against an iterable type. Oh yeah. Which kind of assumed um, the subtyping. What if I wanted to match uh, a type exactly against an iterable, and um, this way I wanted um, I, I didn't want to accept a subtype of an iterable, but exactly an iterable of something. Hmm. I think this was visible in one of the next slides, which... Yes, uh, uh, this one, right? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm actually not sure uh, how we would encode... The... Yeah, uh, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so one thing you could do is uh, you put uh, both the scrutiny, the X, and the pattern in a non-variant type like box, right? So mm. you say scrutiny is box of X, and you pattern match against box of iterable, because box is non-variant, you get a subtype only if it's exactly the type. So that's, that's how you would do it, I guess. Uh, will there be quasi-quotes, or does uh, do the other quotes and splices kind of supplant that? So. Um, yeah, quasi quotes and the quotes and splices are quite, like, quite different because uh, quotes and splices, uh, as I showed them, are just expressions. The quasi quotes work on trees. So the quasi quotes are uh, um, um, a nice way to uh, abstract over the trees. So it's not currently the plan to actually implement them, but it would be possible to, to add it later just as a layer on top of the. Uh, Tree API, but because we already had this nice, uh, nice quotes and splices, we usually can do most of the work directly on that. And whenever we have to switch to the other, it's usually not too big, so, it's, so it has not so far been really necessary to write short code. Um, um, is this feature experimental, like macros in Scala 2, or is this really a feature of Scala 3? It is a feature. So all the first one, first features with the type matches and inline are concrete features. Uh, the quotes and splices will be probably for Scala 3 1. And, and the other one, uh, and the, 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 the uh, reflect, uh, we're going to use it internally, at least. Uh, I'm not sure if it will, be, it will be fully stable by 3.1, but eventually it should be also part of. Because in this case, what we're actually reflecting is the, is the tasty format, which will be stable from, we, we, we want to ensure that it will be stable from 3.1 onwards. So from there onwards, we should also be able to just stable, have a stable, API for that. Um, will inlining be a solution to overcome type erasure, or will you still need class text for that? Uh, it, we can leverage inline to, to, to leverage type erasure. Uh, I, I, I actually showed some example to, to, uh, to Dennis, who do, do, does uh, Spire, that is presenting right now, uh, but uh, where um, if, so the main idea is if, if you have a type parameter uh, and you create an inline method, this method will be inline before it's, the type is erased. So whenever we are going to specialize, we will already know the, the more precise type information. Now, we have to discover for, no, that's not trivial for all the cases. Sometimes we, we, we may need to find the correct uh, 
uh, coding patterns to achieve all that we want with Erasure. But uh, for the most uh, straightforward things, it's, it's trivial. Um, is there a rule of thumbs as to when you should use inline and when you should use macros? Uh, the rule is uh, start with inline. If that uh, works for your use case, then probably stick with it. If you need more power, then go to macros. But because you, you, you saw that uh, the, the, the inline definition is exactly the same, you don't need to change the interface that the user will see. So you create an inline def, you, you create your method, and then you see, oh, I need more, then you just change the implementation to use something more powerful. Thank you for the talk. Um, what, would, what will happen if I create an infinite loop in a match type? Um, there are some mechanisms. The, 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 the compiler will uh, keep track of recursion, and if you go uh, too far, it will just tell you, oh, we, we, we reached this maximum uh, recursion limit. And if it's actually a, tr uh, and if you actually have a really long type, uh, you may increase that limit uh, manually. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, we're here. Okay. Well, uh, I thought it was fantastic, and I learned quite a lot. Um, thank you. Uh, the mentioned Tasty is intended to be uh, non-compiler specific, which I really love. Um, is there anything that it would be useful for, kind of, from an external tooling standpoint at, at this point, or is it right now just the first phase of some uh, more general concept? Oh, uh, Tasty. We're already using Tasty for the IDE, for example. Okay. So we get uh, all the information that the IDE wants from the Tasty. So we compile down to Tasty, and then the IDE just loads that and looks at the trees, the position. It finds the position. It can find where the references are from that and all those kinds of things. We also can do uh, documentation from it because we all have all the doc comments in there. So we are actually just compiling, and then there is another thing that will consume that Tasty and generate the doc docs. That makes me very happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, the question is, how is the inline dev uh, represented in Tasty? Is it completely inline already, or is it still as a function, or? Oh, um, yeah, so, so in Tasty, we, we, we basically keep the, the whenever we have a, a we, we keep the whole tree inside of the, of the, of the file. So whenever we're, we just keep that tree, we keep we, we mark it as inline, and we, we, we massage a bit the, the body of the inline method to make it be inlineable, easily inlineable. Uh, but then whenever you're going to inline it, the, what we need to do is just go into Tasty, read the Tasty, take that tree that is there, and take that tree directly, and then uh, start uh, constant folding and doing the rest. Uh, so. All right, thank you very much for the talk, Nicola. Um, guys, we are really running over time, oh, so sorry. <laughs> I think we have to stop the question-answer session. Thank you.